Welcome, everyone, to another episode of the Rod and Staff podcast. I'm Rod Saunders from Jew and Greek, and joining me today from California is Elijah Stevens. Now, Elijah is uh, a guy that I've I've never met until tonight. Uh, we just exchanged a few messages and so forth to set up the interview, but uh, he's got an interesting background that I think a lot of you would uh, benefit from. He graduated with a Masters in apologetics from Biola. Spent uh, what, about five, seven years as a, a pastor with the Vineyard Church, and he is now an apologetics instructor at uh, the Bethel School of Supernatural Ministry. So, Elijah, thanks for joining us. Oh, thank you. Let's start off with just uh, covering, uh, well, basically how your testimony, how you got saved, and how you uh, came to be an apologist. Oh, my testimony is, um, I was about 12 years old, and I was questioning if God was real, and I prayed, God, if you're real, show me in a way that I know that I know, and this is at the end of church camp. A year goes by, nothing happens, and the next year, um, I experience the presence of God, and I give my life to Jesus, you know, and then after that, uh, I went to a Christian school, started having lots of intellectual doubt. I went to the charismatic movement to maybe experience more of God. And then I got into apologetics because I wanted to bridge the gap between the intellectual world and the supernatural world. I don't think a lot of people are able to articulate its reality. So, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, Viola, I guess, is... uh close to where you grew up? No, um, I I have been taking classes down there for the last few years. Um, it, it's probably one of the best apologetics programs in the world today, I think. So, yeah. I've heard that. So, how do charismatics respond to somebody uh, putting so much emphasis on apologetics? Uh, some of them think... You know, I'm, I'm not following the Spirit. Others come alive because they haven't heard people that can articulate uh, the truth of God's Word and move in power at the same time. Mm -hmm. And I think that's rare, but it used to not be the case. Like, people like Jonathan Edwards, you know, he was a father of the Great Awakenings, also the third president of Princeton. And so we've lost our heritage of an in intellectual life. Right. Yeah, it'd be good to recapture some of that in the charismatic yeah. movement. Uh, okay, before we get into any of these uh, these nitty gritty details of theology, you also have a movie you've been working on, right? Uh, it's called Sin Proof, and it's about my journey to look for medical evidence for miracles. And so, what I do is I interview skeptics and I interview cr Christians and I interview doctors and I go and I look at, at claims of miracles and go, you know, is this medically possible or not? Mm -hmm. Right. What's the most out, outrageous miracle that you've documented so far? Uh, a lady who was blind for 13 years from macular degeneration uh, wow. one night after prayer instantaneously got her sight back and she went from uh, less than 2200 uh, blindness, which is legally blind, to about 2040, which, you know, isn't perfect, but you're seeing super well. So, yeah. Right. And you've got all the medical records and everything of her history. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 That's great. And so when will, when will the movie be finished? Um, it's in its finishing stages now. We're trying to get it through the insurance process and release it in the next few months. Right. So... Let us know about that. And I'll I definitely will. I definitely will. Or to all my subscribers. Okay, so now let's get into some of the controversial issues and mm -hmm. some of the less controversial issues just that, uh, that people need to be mindful of uh, because there's been a lot of uh, controversy about Bethel Church and Bill Johnson sure. Sure. and uh, the so-called New Apostolic Reformation. Mm -hmm. uh, so... Uh, one of the things that people are always asking about is grave soaking. Sure. So, uh, you know, you're out there. You're dealing sure. with these 
Well, have you ever been involved in any grave soaking or you know anybody that has? No. Um, what I do know is that a few students one time went to the grave of somebody. They laid on it. Uh, I think because they believed, you know, God might give them some type of anointing. Um, but Bill has been very vocal about being against that. Um, he did an interview with Michael Brown, and I think we're going to leave that in the notes about the 15 minute mark where he publicly denounces uh, any type of grave soaking. Um, it, it, it's not a part of our culture, but the nature of the internet is that bad ideas sometimes spread fast. And so when you put stuff online, that becomes permanent. Yeah. And you just have to live with it, I guess. Unless you're a politician and you can get it scrubbed. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty awesome, yes. But, yeah, I, I heard Chris Valentin's statement on that, that it was just kind of a running joke, and then apparently somebody decided to take it serious. Right, right. And, uh, okay, and so now another thing that people always want to ask about is the, uh, the idea that Jesus ceased to be God. Right. Uh, based on the uh, something that Bill Johnson, and I don't know if others have, have uh, made that statement, yeah. or, but could you clarify that a little bit? Yeah, what, yeah. What, um, uh, there, the idea is that, you know, there have been times where Bill has said something along the lines of Christ set aside his divinity in order to perform miracles. And what has happened is people have started accusing Bill of teaching a heresy called kenosis. And in reality, I think part of the problem is that is semantics. I, uh, we at Bethel believe in what's called the hypostatic union. This is what Orthodox Christians believe is that Jesus was fully God, fully man from conception throughout his life death, resurrection, and into eternity. Um, and so sometimes things aren't articulated perfectly, but that's what we teach our students. Um, we are Orthodox Christians. You can go read it on our website. We're very clear. Jesus was fully God, fully man. Eternally God. He was. He didn't have a yeah. time. He was created, yeah. began. Yeah. But, yeah. Right. yeah, and, you know, the second person of the Trinity took on a body, you know, and and he did, he restricted himself throughout his life. Uh, there was times he, the second person of the Trinity, did not act to do a miracle, but the Father or the Son, or excuse me, or the Spirit did the particular miracle. And I uh, we're going to include in the notes a debate between Michael Brown and uh, J James White, mm -hmm. uh, Doctor White where both of them talk about kenosis as something we need to talk about uh, right. in the church. And there's various levels of degree disagreement about how restricted, you know, the second person of the Trinity made himself, but that doesn't make people heretics. And right. so what's happening is we're tearing the body apart because we define heresy so narrow. And like mm -hmm. back in the day, there was a difference between Formal heresy and material heresy. Material is, I just misspoke. Mm -hmm. I, I, I misspoke. Oops. And that happens to every theologian. I, I mean, I've been in the pulpit and misspoke. And then there's like, I believe a lie. That's formal heresy. And so you could say Jehovah's Witnesses are formal heretics. But when your brother and sister misspeaks, you just go, well, this is a better way to articulate it rather than call them out or bring shame to their ministry. And I think we're supposed to go to our brothers and sisters and say, hey, I heard this. Can you clarify? And I don't think a lot of people do that. And I think that's bringing unhealthiness and disunity to the body of Christ. Right. I've got a video clip of Dr. Michael Horton, okay, Reformed minister, saying before you earn the right to critique somebody's theology— you have to first of all establish and, and verify from them that that is what they believe. Uh, mm -hmm. We've got to represent yeah. uh, even our, uh, our theological opponents <laughs> in a way that they would recognize. I tell my students in class, if, if you write a paper 
where you are critical of a particular person, even if it's a, a well-known philosopher or uh, writer, uh, you have to state the position in terms that that person would recognize, would recognize yeah. before you earn the right Absolutely to critique right. it. That's one of the rules, I think. Oh, okay, cool. And I think that's it's it's a good policy, I think. Yeah. But before I comment on what somebody said, let me first of all get a clarification and make right. sure that that's what they meant. Right. Otherwise, I'm I'm misrepresenting their theology because I heard them right. misspeak. Uh, I have said in several videos that uh, Bill Johnson does not mean that Jesus ceased to be God when he says he right. said his divinity. Right. He was not talking about his divine essence. He was talking right. about his divine capacity or or his right to use his divine abilities. Right. Divine prerogatives. Yeah. Prerogatives. Yep. Right. Yep. There's there's a yep. number of ways that you can word it sure. without. Yeah just coming right out and saying Jesus ceased to be God. That's that's right. what that's what people latch on to, assuming that right. he's that Jesus is not eternally God, which he has never said. Right. Uh, so it's good to hear that from somebody who actually knows Bill Johnson. I, I've never met him. I've never been to Bethel, but I am a charismatic. I have been to a charismatic Bible school, and I have been taught the same things regarding Jesus ministering by the power of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. And so when I hear Bill Johnson say, or, or Todd White, Todd White has said it too. He set aside his divinity. And I'm like, oh, I know what they mean, but they're not saying it right. Because they're, sure, not, sure, sure. they're not theologians, they're, they're teachers. They're right. trying to equip the saints to do the work. They're not trying to right. write you know, a book on systematic theology. Right, right. Yeah. Okay. And uh, so, what are the, some of the other more controversial things? Uh, it's like the born again Jesus. I think Bill Johnson has said that Jesus is born again. Uh, right. Has and he has clarified what he meant by that as well, right? Right. Uh, he means Jesus came back from the dead, um, and that's it. <laughs> well, uh, uh, you know, the first birth is coming out of your mom. The second is coming out of the grave. Um, and there is nothing beyond that. Um, I think Bill likes to be a bit provocative at times and make people think. Um, but we, we definitely don't believe Jesus ceased to exist in the grave or ceased to be God or took on some, some other type of nature. Yeah. That provocative style, that's a two-edged sword. It is, yes. Yeah, uh, but uh, it's at Acts thirteen thirty three, I believe it is. It says that uh, this day have I begotten you in terms mm -hmm. of the resurrection, mm -hmm. and uh, so that's what you know. I just that's the yeah. way I took it. That sure. when he's saying that Jesus was born again, he was born once in Bethlehem. He was born again in his resurrection, mm -hmm. but that doesn't mm -hmm. mean that that he affirms this, you know, descending into hell where you're tortured by demons and you have to, you know, get saved, all of that, that some people say that charismatics believe. Sure. And, well, the, the farthest extent is that Jesus became the devil or took on Satan-like attributes. Mm -hmm. um, and we certainly don't teach that at Bethel. Right. I, I have never heard anybody teach that. I have heard uh, Kenneth Hagin say, mm -hmm. I heard him say that Jesus took upon himself the nature of Satan. And people took that to mean that he had a satanic nature. But sure. what he meant was that he bore that satanic nature away. Sure. sure. Just like the scapegoat bore away the guilt of Israel off into the wilderness. Right. Not his nature actually changed. Right. And but, I encourage anyone watching that if, you know, if you hear a minister say something, Break it down to its smallest, like you can that you can make it, and go and ask that person. I, most ministers stick around after conferences, um, and Bill certainly answer your questions. He's answered mine, and they're not offensive. And so, if you need a little bit of clarity, I, I think that's healthy. But don't bombard the internet. Don't blow up the internet calling people out for stuff maybe they didn't articulate the way you would like them to articulate. Mm -hmm. Okay. So now let's get into essential doctrines. Okay. Uh, like, uh, well, let's just start with Christology. Okay. Uh, what is it that you and Bethel believe about Jesus? 
uh, fully God, fully man, true God, true man, hypostatic union. Um, and we believe in the Trinity. We believe in the virgin birth. We believe the Apostles' Creed, um, death, resurrection, ascension, that we need Jesus, that the gospel is Jesus, that he came in, you know, God's plan from Adam through Israel is to send Jesus, and that we are to die to our sins and follow Jesus. And that is what the gospel is. Okay, so your version of the gospel you think would would that would go uh, well with any evangelical church? I mean, apart from your terminology, uh, just your belief system would fit in any evangelical church? Um, if it doesn't fit, they're not evangelical. Like, that is the orthodox position, is the Apostles' Creed. And so that is what we're committed to, and... Um, it would fit in anyone for sure. Right. Okay. Uh, because I've, I've dealt with this a lot, especially mm -hmm. the movie American Gospel Christ Alone, where the implication mm -hmm. is that uh, these people don't preach the gospel of the Bible. Mm -hmm. And I think the problem, you correct me if you think I'm misspeaking here, but to me it sounds like they're taking the theology and they're saying that that's our presentation of the gospel, you know, because mm -hmm. we believe in in uh, miracles, we believe in visions, uh, we mm -hmm. believe in prosperity. Well, mm -hmm. you know, that's prosperity gospel, that's not the gospel of the <laughs> Bible. But you're, you're trying to uh, cherry pick different theological positions and say that's their presentation of the gospel. It would be like saying that the Assemblies of God have a speaking in tongues gospel. Right, right, right. Uh, because you've got to go back and say, well, what is the gospel itself? And when people say it is Jesus dying on the cross and resurrecting and being our, you know, vicarious sacrifice for our sins, and we all go, yes, 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 I believe that, but we have a different view. You know, some people have a view about what the atonement brings. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean you're preaching a different gospel. You can say, I disagree with that version of, you know, what... Is, is there healing in the atonement or not? But that doesn't make someone a false preacher. Right. Um, it just means they made a false statement, and um, that's fine. But we can't split the church over whether or not you know these people are preaching the gospel, because clearly they are. Clearly people are getting saved um, and believing in the Christ of Scripture. Mm-hmm. Right, yeah, I've got a clip of Nabil Qureshi, where he visited Bethel, and he said, I heard the gospel explicitly preached there. Jesus died for our sins, his blood shed for the remission of sins. And so he actually went to the trouble to go there and hear firsthand, right. instead of going right. by what people on the internet were saying. Right, which I think right, right. Would be, you know, uh, wisdom to do that. Yeah, yeah. So, Okay. And, and the bill was super celebrated here. That we were so glad that we had someone uh, from his background and his testimony of, you know, ex experiencing Jesus. And lots of Muslims are being saved through visions of Jesus right now. There's a good documentary uh, called uh, "Wolves Among Lamb" or "Lambs Among Wolves," part two, just came out recently, and it just talks about these people in Iran, how the watching Islam made them leave the mosque, and many are having visitations of Jesus, and the church is exploding there. Right. Um, if you want a powerful, powerful documentary, you need to watch that. Right. I hadn't heard about the, the movie. I did uh, talk about the, the book, uh, mm -hmm. Jesus Visiting the Muslim World, Dreams and Visions by Tom mm -hmm. Boyle. I don't okay. know if you're familiar with him I, or not. I think I've, I've got it in my library. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. You, you've probably got a huge library. <laughs> it sounds to me like you're a bookworm. Yeah. But uh, that's something that I had to deal with because of the, the claim that God doesn't speak through dreams and visions anymore. Right. Right. Uh, because if charismatics can't have dreams and visions, then Muslims can't have dreams and visions. So uh, that a, a lot of people in, in certain theological camps are claiming that Muslims are not having dreams and visions and there's, there's no substance to their stories, but there's just too much. 
evidence, too, too many documented cases, including right. Nipple's testimony. Right. So uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, things like uh, the evangelism, the approach to evangelism that uh, mm -hmm. Bill Johnson and his uh, other people who are like Heidi Baker and uh, let's see, like Chuck Pierce, you you are aligned somewhat with with certain ministers who are so called NAR, right? We don't call ourselves that. Uh, I was talking to uh, Chris Mallaton the other day, and he's. I use that phrase NAR, and he's like, what's that mean? Because there is no one in our movement that calls ourselves the New Apostolic Reformation. Like, that is an outside label. Um, Revival Alliance might be a better term for, for, for our group. Um, but what it does, if you make up a label, you can make up doctrine, false doctrine about people as well. And so... Um, I do know that Peter Wagner started a, a group uh, back in the 80s called the New Apostolic Reformation, but that was the equivalent of like a network. And one of the things I would highly encourage anyone who is in a discernment ministry who's watching this is let charismatics define themselves. Like my biggest problem with American gospel is they just lump all these groups together. Mm -hmm. And they just treat us as one, and then they pick the worst doctrine of every person in that group. And I'm not saying American Gospel did that in particular, but I've read books that have done that. Mm -hmm. And so what it does is it makes people not critically think about what individual ministers believe. And mm -hmm. what's unique about the charismatic uh, movement is that there's people from all perspectives that are drawn into it. Francis Chan, I, I mean, Matt Chandler, John Piper believes in healing and prophecy. So it, it's pretty diverse, and you need to let individuals speak for themselves. And it, when you call us all NAR, what it does is it just shuts people's brains off, and they stop listening. Right. It's just like well, you guys are, you know, way out in the left field. You don't know what yeah. you're talking about because right. there is the the the, the NAR as C. Peter Wagner defined it was a 20th century church growth movement in right. China, Africa, and Latin America. Yeah, right, and right, right. Then it was later uh, they added in the American charismatic churches, and then somehow or another sure. that morphed into this 21st century movement of apostles with the same authority as the apostles in the bible right and uh you know this the theocratic agenda they're going to take over the world yeah. Yeah. and uh, you, you do affirm a close canon of scripture correct i i do and i actively disagree with stuff bill or chris or dan or anyone in our movement like there's not a person in in at bethel that i agree with a hundred percent and I don't feel like I what what makes us different than what people think is people think, oh, they call them a prophet. Therefore, that person has authority to speak for God rather than that person trains people how to hear from God. Mm -hmm. um, an evangelist trains people how to share Jesus. A teacher trains people how to read the Bible. And so it's about empowerment. It is not authoritative. And I think that is the difference. Scripture's authoritative. I bend my knee to Scripture. Um, I'm in relationship with a Bill or a Chris or a Dan. And so I'm not trying to be like them in the sense of I adopt everything they say doctrinally. It is I want to model godly aspects of their character and run for Jesus together. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Good. Okay, now, so when we're talking about uh, the Word of God as our authority, um, what does Bill Johnson and, and what does Bethel believe about the Bible? Because there are some people out there saying that Bill Johnson tries to discourage people from reading the Bible. He tries to downplay the authority of Scripture and emphasize experience and mm -hmm. dreams uh. and so forth. So what, what is your view on uh, the authority of Scripture? 
Well, if that's the case, no one told me that uh, because I teach the Bible line by line in their Sunday school. Um, I've ta taught books like First John and Philippians, and I do the historical background and go line by line through the text. Um, in BSSM, we make the students read the Bible cover to cover, and they do a hermeneutics book called Grasping God's Word and have to, like— watch videos uh, by the Bible Project because we believe that Scripture transforms lives. In fact, that is one of our core values mm -hmm. is that God's Word transforms us. And so, again, what this is is people projecting on the hyper-charismatic movement what they want to see and what you need to see in order to reject some of its more extreme claims that God is healing people. Mm -hmm. And so if you can... Call them heretics, say they don't believe the Bible, call them whatever, then you no longer, most people won't listen to their message. And so it's called poisoning the well. Right. Uh, it's a logical fallacy, and it keeps people from critically thinking about the content that is coming out. Mm -hmm. So you don't see any, uh, any effort at Bethel to downplay the scriptures and, no. to, and to emphasize experience or, or the supernatural more than the scriptures themselves? Um, I will say sometimes I'll run across a student or two that does that. Um, but that's any school you go to, you're going to have crazy students. Um, but I, I think we're trying to take scripture seriously. I think what a big difference is and Craig Keener talks about this in Spirit Hermeneutics, is that there is a difference between reading a text and then trying to live a text and reading it. And the Bible was meant to be lived and read. And so that does shape your reading of it. And so if it is the case that God heals people and gives prophetic words today, that's going to shape your, the way you interpret it. And mm -hmm. so sometimes what we're accused of is um, we do not take the Bible seriously when living it is taking it seriously. Right. God's much more interested in us living out the teachings of Jesus than he is about us articulating them correctly. Right. And, and, you know, I strive to articulate them correctly, but I'll be judged much more severely by what I did with them. Right. Now, yeah. that's, that was the impression that I got, uh, because I read When Heaven Invades Earth, and sure. I didn't get what a lot of the critics got uh, from mm -hmm. what Johnson right. said at all. I thought it was a great yeah. book, and then I hear all these people calling it heresy, and I'm saying, w wait a minute now, are we yeah. reading same book and we are reading the same book but we're reading it through different lenses i'm reading it as somebody who understands the the language and yeah. the mindset of somebody who wants to see the application of it right and right. Uh, and, 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 uh, and there's one or two sentences i would reword like it, i uh but overall the gist is God wants us to learn to think from heaven and to learn to approach situations as he would approach them, as Jesus approached them. And so we start with believing God can do the impossible, and we pray from that perspective, which I think is highly biblical. Mm -hmm. um, if, if, if the, com you know, the Lord's prayer is thy kingdom come, and we're to partner with God to see his kingdom come, Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't see why you don't have to change your perspective radically to, to right. live the Christian lifestyle. Right. So you, you view the Bible, I guess, as, as more of a, uh, uh, instruction manual on how to do ministry and how to live the Christian life than on a, just a, a book on systematic theology or something. Right. But... I highly value systematic theology. I, I think that apologetics is spiritual warfare, and I think that the early church was both intellectually engaged and walked in supernatural power, and we see the first three centuries of Christianity. Um, 
right after the apostles died, apologists rose up and they're writing emperor's letters debunking false gods. Mm -hmm. And what happens is this multi-level revival happens in Roman culture where people start realizing the teachings of Jesus are are answering the questions the Greek philosophers asked on how to live a good life. Right. And at the same time, Christians are going into temples and casting demons out of people, and people are seeing God's power, and we got to come back and meld the two together again. Right. We, yeah, I have said that uh, we need more emphasis on theology. When I said that a minute ago about systematic theology, I love systematic theology. Right. I, I think it's very important, but you also need to have the power of the Holy Spirit in manifestations, right. and right. we've got some segments of Christianity that downplay the role uh, of, the, of the ministry of the Holy Spirit in evangelism and uh, fulfilling the Great Commission, and then you've got people in the charismatic camp who downplay the role of education about the Bible and theology, and they call the right. cemeteries cemeteries, which that always annoyed me to hear people say, right, right. Oh, you go to the cemetery, I mean seminary, uh, right. because that's kind of an uh, anti-intellectual approach right. to Christianity that I think we need to get over. Right, and I think, uh, you know, the hyper-charismatic movement's trying to do that. Randy Clark is the president of a seminary. Um, and so Regent, I think, is trying to do charismatic, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, be a, be a renewal-focused uh, seminary. And so I think there's a shift that is occurring. Um, it, it's training charismatics who don't have a taste for the intellectual life right. and who go, hey, you can't be spirit led and have both and training them. No, there are good examples of people who did this. Heidi Baker has her PhD. Roland Baker has his PhD and they're, they're changing Africa. Um, when they went there, it was 3% Christian. Now it's 27, 28% Christian. Her, um, her, it is. Hmm? You talking about her nation, Mozambique? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, it, it is radically transformed by the gospel right now. And, right. you know, they are very deep theologically. Roland was probably one of my best interviews in my film. And I interviewed people like William Lane Craig and J.P. Moreland and um, Gary Habermas. And so, like, those are big-name evangelicals. And Roland... I, at a theological level, was just on his game. And so uh, we, we can't discount uh, charismatic intellectuals. Craig Keener, president of, you know, the, oh gosh, uh, Evangelical Theological Society right now is a charismatic. And uh, he is one of the strongest intellectuals in Christendom, I would think. N.T. Wright speaks in tongues. I've heard um, that. Yeah, and so we're just, we we pretend like so many of these people don't have supernatural experiences, and I think charismaticism is blowing throughout the church right now, but it's easy to target a Bethel if you're super cessationist, mm -hmm. rather than go, Oh, yeah, if Chris Valentin's a false prophet, so is John Piper, because he teaches prophecy happens. So is Matt Chandler. So is Stephen Bancars. Uh, and so it, it, it's logically inconsistent at some level to me what, what's occurring in, in discernment ministries. Uh, even some of the people in the apologetics and discernment world claim to be charismatics. Oh and, yeah, and still take issue with the so-called NAR or or Bill Johnson and Bethel. Sure, sure, sure. And it's fair to critique. Um, it's just what are you critiquing? Mm -hmm. um, and and that's where I go. I'm not sure you're asking good questions or trying to be discerning, because one of my problems with some discernment ministries 
is discernment is the act of taking an idea, cutting out the bad, and focusing on the truth. And what happens is a lot of people just watch internet video after internet video after internet video. And so it becomes a feedback chamber right. rather than doing firsthand research. Mm -hmm. And if I were in a, if I could just encourage discernment ministries to do anything, it is to take your time and read the entire canon of what someone's trying to say. Um, because just like the Apostle Paul wrote books, and if you took one book, you would not understand his entire view of Christ. Right. Um, if you took uh, Philemon, you're probably not going to understand his passion for the resurrection of Christ. In the same way, people will take one sentence of Bill Johnson and say that's his Christology rather than 40 years of ministry, and I find that ridiculous. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Now, before we started taping, we were talking a little bit about the Reformation. Uh -huh. and, uh, you were talking about your uh, respect for people in the Reformed camp because oh, yeah. of their grasp of uh, the history of theology. You want to talk about that a little bit? Sure, sure, sure. I, I grew up Reformed. Those are the people that taught me the Bible. Um, Wayne Grudem... Uh, helped write a book called Systematic Theology. Got it. And he's, yeah, and love it. Uh, that's what uh, John Wimber, I think he dedicated part of that book to John Wimber, uh, was into. And so I absolutely love the reform movement, and I feel very at home in those circles. And that's why... I co-equally find myself at home in charismatic circles because when I think about what Scripture teaches, um, I cannot reach the cessationist conclusion, and I reform my theology through reading the text. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, your understanding of sola scriptura, because we, we were talking about that. As oh, well. yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, one of the problems I think that I see in discernment ministries, we were talking about that, is their labeling of heresy. It, it, what happens is people will call people heretics, but they don't know that heresy comes back to the creeds. So the Trinity, you know, who Christ is, human depravity. Uh, the necessariness of salvation by faith alone in Christ's work. And what happens is people in the Reform movement sometimes go, ah, sola scriptura, that was one of the Reformation's cries. Therefore, if you don't have a particular view of sola scriptura, which is cessationism, then you are a heretic. And I see that come up over and over and over again, and I go, that is not true. Um, Norm Geisler wrote a book on uh, essential Christian doctrine, and even he will say that belief in sola scriptura is not essential Christian doctrine. It's not a necessary truth for salvation to occur. And so... We have to stop doing that because, you know, James 4 says, brothers and sisters, do not slander one another. Um, and we have to avoid slandering people. And if someone's approach to Christianity allows for the ongoing of prophecy, that does not make them a heretic according to creedal Christianity. Mm. Yeah, as I understand it, Sola Scriptura originally meant a rejection of papal authority and right. church tradition uh, right. on par with the scriptures. But it right. seems like today some people are using sola scriptura in the sense that you're adding to the canon of scripture if you have a word of knowledge. Right. And what makes even a word of knowledge different than canon is that canon is universal and word of knowledge is local. And so... Um, and 
also it's God bringing stuff to mind. It's it, it's not necessarily authoritative. And so I highly recommend people to read The Gift of Prophecy by Wayne Grudem if you come from a Reformed background or stuff by Sam Storms um, who are wrestling with this. This is Reformers going, I, I think prophecy happens today and I don't think it violates Sola Scriptura. And in fact, the appendix of The Gift of Prophecy has a long... Uh, <clears throat> chapter on the authoritativeness of scripture. And I have heard reformer after reformer testify that they thought it was an excellent uh, rendition on, on scriptural authority. Right. Yeah. Uh, Sam Storms is, in, I believe, in Oklahoma City. I, I don't know his location at all. Right down the, right down the road from me, I've, I've heard... Oh. On a couple of because I'm in Tulsa, yeah, I've heard yeah. him on a couple of occasions, and I, I'm sure that we would disagree on soteriology, mm -hmm. but uh, he he is approaching these things, I think, in an, in an honest way, uh, right. in order to understand, you know, what what is still a part of Christian ministry mm -hmm. in the 21st century, right. And, uh, do these do these gifts and ministry offices still apply today? I think right. it's somebody from the reformed camp is you know pursuing that the way that uh, Wayne Grimm and Sam Storms are. Yeah, one of the things I would love to see is for the leaders of discernment ministries and people in the charismatic movement to do is to meet together privately. I, I think there's a lot of things that get resolved when you have conversations where the goal is to understand each other. And mm -hmm. it's it's really hard to <laughs> not love your brother when you realize, oh, he was just communicating something differently. Right. And um, it's, it's way better than the YouTube videos we're producing right now. Right. I've tried to get a yeah. dialogue with several of the critics, and they yeah. don't to be interested in a dialogue. Yeah. yeah. I was very impressed with the guys at Cultish, to be honest. Um, they were very helpful. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and we formed relationship after that. Um, we, we, we're still in dialogue, and, you know, at, at the end, they're willing to call me a brother uh, because. I think we just have to get together and the illusion of YouTube is that we're talking and we're not, and we're not making time for each other. And there is something about the unity of Christ. When you sit down and eat a meal with someone and you talk over scripture, you go, that person loves Jesus. And I can tell you the stuff they said in that first episode, I, We've talked about how strong that was, mm -hmm. but I know those guys love Jesus, and I, they're my brothers and are passionate about the Lord, and I celebrate their desire to end abortion in America. That's beautiful. Their desire to go to Mormon temples and talk to people about Jesus and Jehovah's Witnesses, and so I bless them. I, I bless many of the discernment ministries that call us out. Uh, there's stuff that needs to be said it's just we've got to do it differently true yeah but we do have a tendency i think to talk right past each other oh and, yeah uh it would be great if we could have some sort of a a dialogue or some sort of a, like james white did with the muslim imam yeah 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 interfaith dialogue maybe we need something like that between the the yeah. charismatic and, and uh, non-charismatic camps well, it's it's a condemnation against us that we don't have it, mm -hmm. because you know Ephesians tells us to strive for unity, and if if someone can acknowledge the Apostles' Creed, then they are your brother, and you have to fight to love that person at mm -hmm. the level of family, and that's that's the hard one. Right. Yeah. Well, we've gone way over our thirty-minute time limit, but this was so good, I didn't want to stop. So, yeah, I I appreciate your time, Elijah, and uh, 
you can, I, I guess, if you have any questions for Elijah, you can leave them in the comment section below the video. Uh, hopefully we'll have him on again sometime and we'll have uh, another opportunity to delve a little further into some of these issues. So uh, thanks everybody for watching. Thanks for Elijah for joining us and we'll see you next time. All right. Bye guys.